Hi, I'm Easton Deverna, creator of stories like Samurai Grandpa, Through the Shadow of Titans, and A Guardian. And you're here watching Two Geeks Talking. We are joined today by a very talented individual. I've heard of him from other people like Sean Daly, who was on the show in the past. It's, it's safe to say that his body of work is, is vast and amazing and incredible. So we are joined today by the ever-talented Easton Deverna. Author of Through the Shadow of Titans, which is my newest book. Been in the works for quite a while, and it will be released very, very soon. It's at the printer as we speak, so that's very exciting. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, who are you and what is this project about? Yeah, so I'm Easton Deverna. I am a dad. <laughs> I was just telling Kurt about spending some time with my daughter before the show. A writer, I like to garden. Yeah, so I've written a couple of things. Uh, Samurai Grandpa, A Guardian, um, The Runner, Mother, and a few other things. And Through the Shadow of Titans is my newest book, and that's coming out through Dauntless Stories. On the surface, it's a an illustrated novel. So it's a, it's a blend between prose and, and sequential comic art. It's a big book. It's around 174 pages, I think. Um, so you have sections that read like a traditional novel and you have other parts of the book that read like a comic book. Yeah, so on the surface, it's about a family who's fleeing an apocalyptic blight that destroyed their kingdom. They're searching for a new land and they have to go through these obstacles and trials. And there are these creatures called titans that nobody really knows anything about. There's a lot of other mysteries to uncover. And so a little bit below the surface, I started writing this story about almost two years ago, maybe. Uh, and my daughter was one and it's kind of about like my fears or it touches upon a lot of my fears about being a father or being a parent and raising a child in pretty crazy, sometimes harsh and unforgiving world, but a world that can be beautiful, amazing, all the same. So I kind of channeled some of that, those early parenting fears and thoughts into, into this story. What is your creative kryptonite? My creative kryptonite, I have two. One I think is time and not enough time. I find myself sometimes not hitting writer's block, but sometimes facing like, oh, I need to take time away from actually writing and creating to handle all of the other aspects of being an indie writer, which is promotion, you know, marketing, sometimes like team management, making sure that uh, any deadlines are being met and that, you know, everyone is happy while they're working, that sort of thing. But also the other one I think would be something like Twitter and I'm getting better at it, but sometimes that can be such a time sink. I've been getting better at putting it aside, but sometimes you can get lost uh, down the rabbit hole when you should be writing or creating. What is the second wisest piece of advice that has stuck with you in your creative career? I like that you are asking for the second wisest piece of advice. I think that's really cool. There's a comic creator, writer named uh, Jim Zub. He's done Skull Kickers and, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, he did a Samurai Jack uh, run and some Marvel stuff. Quite prolific. But on one of his blogs, he wrote, Jealousy Being Creative Poison. When I first read this, this was earlier on in my career, and it's uh it's essentially talking about, you know, don't focus on other people's success and think that that's where you should be. Or, you know, you see all these announcements or great other creators, writers, artists signing deals, and you're not, and you're just toiling away in your writing cave. That's a waste of your time. Be happy for those people and understand that you are where you need to be and that, you know, you just keep at it and, and all comes in, in good time. And that's something that really stuck with me when I first read that uh, article on his blog. And it's something that I've said to other creatives or people who are starting out and they're saying, well, how come I haven't hit it yet? Look at this person. Look at this person. It's like, but don't worry about them. You know, they're doing their own thing and they had do it in their time and, and you need to do it in yours. And that's always stuck with me. Um, and I still think about that um, here and then every time that that little, uh, you know, jealous bug comes to uh, comes to bite you. In terms of creative jealousy, do you think creative jealousy and imposter syndrome go hand in hand? Yeah, I think they do. Imposter syndrome. Yeah. And that's, an, that's another I guess that could be a kryptonite as well. It's it's tough. And then there are times when I'll be writing something and I'm like, this is really good and original. I, I think I'm doing the right thing. And then other times I'll go and read it. And, you know, you're just in, the, in that mindset and you're like, this is trash. I'm, I'm a hack. What am I doing? Uh, and you're looking at, at other people or you're looking at some of your biggest influences 
am I starting to ape their style or am I just drawing the right amount of influence from them and making it my own? So it's very important to have those influences and learn from them, but it's more important to make it your own. Yeah, I think there is an overlap in that, in that Venn diagram. And it's important to take a step back when you're having those thoughts, whether it's you're jealous or whether you're feeling that imposter, sy- imposter syndrome. Um, just take a step back, take a walk, do some exercise, do something other than creating. Get yourself out of that mindset and get get back into it when you're fresh. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I'll get a little bit personal with this one. I was thinking about, you know, sort of language and narrative interchangeable kind of thing. I used to love the Red Wall books written by Brian Jakes. He was a British author. Those really got me into reading and sort of were part of the reason why I wanted to become a writer. Uh, when I was when I was young, I was reading them probably since I was like in fourth grade. And I remember taking them with me everywhere. And one particular year, my aunt was dying of cancer. And so I'd go to the hospital with my parents. And whether I understood what was going on or didn't, or maybe I did understand, but I needed a way to cope with it and escape because it was brand new to me, this concept of death and that we're all not permanent. I took the book like out into the courtyard of the hospital and I would just read Red Wall or Moss, uh, Moss Flower or Metameo, whichever one it was. It sort of transported me into another world entirely and I was able to escape and not think about this harsh reality that I was presented with. I think that was when I sort of understood the power of escapism, but also the power of not just running away from your problems, but learning how to deal with them through narrative and language and and stories and books. And I think it was probably since then where I became hooked on reading and stories and fantasy worlds in particular because of the Redwall books. Just kind of carried on over ever since and still to this day. It's something that I use as a as a crutch when I need it through through life. What did you first create that made you realize, yes, I could do this as a career? I'm going to have to go with Samurai Grandpa on that one. And, you know, Sean Daly, you interviewed him recently, and he is the uh, co-creator and collaborator on that book with me. And that was, you know, it was kind of the weird, quirky idea. If someone just saw the title at a glance, they might think it's a little bit of a goofy story, but um, we put a lot of heart into it. It was just a wonderful experience about learning how to tell a story with someone else. We kickstarted it and we didn't really know what was going to happen. We had a really successful Kickstarter and then we got picked up by SourcePoint Press and and the book went uh, a little bit further even. To this day, it's pretty well uh, reviewed. A lot of people like it. I think that's probably where most people know me um, from doing. I remember thinking one day like, wow, people actually like this weird little fantasy heartfelt story that we created. There might be something to this, this career. And that sort of gave me a confidence boost. I just had so much fun doing it. I said, this is, this is a lot of work, of course, but this is something that I truly enjoy doing and people seem to like it. So let's dip our toe into that pool. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? going to answer creatively speaking, I think. It's someone I've never met because he's dead. Stephen Crane, he's the author of poetry and prose and short stories, mostly known for The Red Badge of Courage. Uh, He's an American author. I read him first, probably when I was in high school and then studied him a little bit more when I was in college. And The Open Boat is my favorite short story, maybe one of my favorite stories ever by him. And uh, I just became fascinated with him because he is such an incredible writer, so prolific. When I found out that he died at the young age of 28, I was like, blown away. The fact that he was able to be so, he had such like a a read on the universe and and the world and people at such a young age, the amount of things that he did in his life. It was just always inspiring to me, the fact that he, that he was able to do this, unfortunately dying. Yeah. Is he someone that I revisit to quite often? Anytime I'm sort of feeling a little bit in the need of that inspiration, I'll pick up his uh, War is Kind collection of poetry or read The Open Boat or something like that. It gets the juices flowing once again. So he's something that I think definitely inspired me and continues to as I go along this uh, creative career. Who was an author that you read initially that you maybe didn't appreciate, but as you got older, you appreciated more? I don't know if how this answer will sound, but I'm going to have to say Shakespeare. I mean, honestly, when I was younger and, you know, in high school and I was an English major in college as well, I didn't appreciate Shakespeare. And then I I was an English teacher for a little while. It was only when I actually started really reading it to understand it, to be able to teach it, 
that I started appreciating it. Now I still go back and I'll read some plays, some of his poetry. It's, it's honestly incredible stuff. Yeah, he's another one, like so prolific. And I think he died also very young at like 55 or something. How does somebody do all of this stuff? And, and at the level of quality that's sustained throughout their careers. So yeah, I'd have to say Shakespeare. Professionally, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I guess there can be a lot of definitions of what can be considered successful. Yeah, I think personally, in a lot of ways, I am. I've achieved a lot of goals that I've set out for myself. I mean, one of those on the professional level is getting published. I have a little bit of an issue, though, where I'm always like, okay, I did this now. What's next? What's the next rung of the ladder? What's the next one? I guess that's a good thing sometimes, but also... I need to be able to tur turn it down a little bit. Personally, I'd have to say, yeah, if I were to die tomorrow and I had the awareness on my deathbed to look back on my life, I think I'd say, yeah, I've done a lot of things just in the professional field, but in my personal life that I think were something that I'd consider successful. Um, I've met a lot of people. I've had a lot of fun. I've traveled. I've seen a lot of the world. You know, I have a wonderful family that I am very grateful for, so yeah, I think I'd give two thumbs up so far. <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? So, I mean, that's inevitable in anything you do in life. Usually when I'm feeling like a failure, I need to restart. I need to reset. And I recognize that. One of the best ways for me to do it is to get away from whatever it is that I've failed at. Usually it goes to hang out with my wife or daughter or go exercise and listen to music, sort of work it out that way. Um, and usually I'll come back feeling recharged and energized. I think though, with failure though, like while I recognize it, I don't always think that it's the end of the world because I think that it's absolutely a part of the path to success. I don't think anyone really just sets out to do something and is automatically success. You know, you have to try and you have to learn. And that's something I have to remind myself when I'm writing, if something isn't clicking or if a book isn't getting the, the reviews or the traction that I really was hoping that it would. It's like, okay, what did I do wrong? And what can I do better now in the future? And the most important thing is just recognize that it's a, it's a failure. It's a part of the journey and just keep moving. That's the best thing that anyone can do. I think at whatever you fail at, you say, okay, I screwed up. Time to keep going, put it behind you and Keep moving, learn from it. The young generations look at your work and they're becoming inspired or creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you and they will eventually become inspired by you and creative in their own way, whatever that may be. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Uh, I think one of the best things that um, the younger generation can do is other than to continue to create, learn from those failures and push forward is to sort of learn how to break the rules with whatever they're doing, whether it's art, writing, uh, music, whatever sort of creation they're doing. Don't be afraid to do what you want to do because along that path, you're going to be told so many rules, so many pro tips, so many, you know, teachers will have their opinions about how you should do something. And if you end up listening to all of that, it can be stifling. You can find yourself with a back against the wall and a sort of creative paralysis. Yes, learn the rules, learn what People have done in the past, but then do something that you want to do and don't be afraid to do it. If you have a new idea, don't say, oh, well, I shouldn't do this because no one's done it before. This or this isn't really the way I'm supposed to write a comic book or, or a novel. Just do it. Just try it. You know, if you think about it, like, who do we remember? The people who followed all the rules and fell in line or, or the, the greats of people who did something new, put a new spin on things. You know, whatever you're doing, put your own twist on it and don't be afraid to to try something a little bit different. Well, I do hate to say this, Easton, but uh, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me, Kurt. I really appreciate it. Definitely have to have you back on for a slightly longer interview. I think you have a lot more to say than, uh, than what we were able to cover here today. But before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And what's, what's next in the future for you? You can find me on Twitter. It's just at Easton Deverna, my name, or Instagram. Usually it's uh, it's at EPD85. Twitter is where I do a lot of my comics posting, really. That's about it over there. Or I'll share a lot of projects. A lot of my friends create projects that they're doing. Instagram is a little bit more. You'll 
take pictures of like my backyard and my garden. I enjoy gardening quite a bit. Yeah, Future Projects Through the Shadow of Titans is coming out very, very soon. Lost Souls that I'm doing with Sean Daly. Actually, we he just sent me a message before we jumped on that it is done and that we're sending the digital version out to backers probably by Saturday. A Guardian Volume 2 is coming to Kickstarter probably in June. Oh, Sean and I actually have a short story coming out in an anthology. The story is called Fight to Death, and there'll be more announcements about that soon. Yeah, and I'll just be posting about this stuff as it comes along. Well, thank you so much, Jason, and greatly appreciate it. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, because I'm only one person, which is <laughs> youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.